Money, 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 money. It wasn't obvious from the intro song. This week, we will be talking about interest groups and money, money and where the politicians get it. Some of you may have noticed last week with those campaign commercials that some politicians spend a little bit more money than others. Hi, I'm Gil Fulbright. The people that run my campaign, they've made this commercial, and I'm in it. This campaign, it's not about me. It's about crafting a version of me that'll appeal to you. A version that visits random work sites with paid actors pointing at things. A version of me that doesn't find old people loathsome or pointless. Has a conventionally attractive yet curiously still family. Listening to my constituents, legislating, these are things I don't do. What I do is spend about 70% of my time raising funds for re-election. I'd do anything to stay in office. My name's Gil Fulbright, but hell, I'll change my name to Phil Goldbright or Bill Fulbright or Fill up my mouth with farts. These are the things that are important to me. And these are the fine people that finance my campaign. Now, in order to do these things, I have to stay in office. And to stay in office, I have to keep these guys happy. Now, if any of these things make these guys unhappy, well, my hands are tied. So come November, the choice is clear. Do you want another spineless mouthpiece for special interest in lobbyists? Or a spineless mouthpiece for special interest in lobbyists? I'm Philip a mouth with farts, and I approve this message. Let's first address two of the things he mentioned at the end, special interest groups and lobbying. What does that even mean? An interest group is an organized group of individuals that make policy-related appeals to government. Most interest groups have a membership, and you're probably familiar with a good number of them. You may have heard of the NRA, whose mission is to protect the Second Amendment rights. Never fight if you can avoid it. But when you must fight, don't lose. And when nothing less than freedom is at stake, we fight. We're millions of people just like you. We're the longest standing civil rights organization in the U.S. Proud defenders of history's patriots. Protectors of the Second Amendment. Advocating the right to keep and bear arms. Creating a vital legacy by answering freedom's call. And we're growing stronger every day. We are the NRA, and the NRA is you. Or maybe you've heard of AARP, whose mission is to empower people as they the age. AARP's work is more important than ever. We hear older Americans loud and clear, and that's why we fight for what they and their families need. Access to health care, affordable prescription drugs, opportunities to save for the future, ending age discrimination, a healthy, financially secure, fulfilling life. That's what AARP fights for because that's what everyone deserves. Join us in fighting for what's right. You may even end up joining a union interest group based on your career. There's the American Federation of Teachers, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, to name a few. So what's the purpose of an interest group? Other than the sense of community you have with like-minded people, um, for instance, AARP members get discounts, right? So that's a benefit of joining a, an interest group. But what is the purpose of an interest group on the grander scale? There are two big things that interest groups focus on. They try to shape government policies by getting voters out or by putting pressure on elected officials. Obviously, the bigger the membership, the more influence they're able to extend. The other big thing they do is gather information and then share it with elected officials. Interest groups mostly focus on the branch of the government where bills are being written. Back to this guy. He mentioned the lobbyists. Lobbyists represent these special My interests. My name is Josh Sanderson and I'm a lobbyist. A lobbyist's job primarily is to work with decision makers, work with elected officials on all different levels, all the way from uh, city councils, school boards at the local level, to legislatures at the state level, the governor's office, all the way up to Congress and presidential administrations. And our job is to work with them to change laws or to make laws that are favorable for the people who we represent. A lobbyist's job is to be an expert in a certain field, and then go and educate elected officials on those issues so that they have input from the people that they represent on the issues that they're working on. Most of the goals that we work on are long-term. They're not something that happened overnight. If you get frustrated easily, 
then this is a very difficult field to work in. There is no typical day. Being a lobbyist has been described as 99% boredom punctuated by 1% sheer terror. Sitting in a committee hearing, for instance, you never know when you're going to be called up front in front of a panel of senators to testify in front of 200 people in the audience. When legislatures are meeting, when laws are being openly discussed and written, we meet with elected officials, with their staff, and meet with them personally in order to help educate them on policy issues. The most difficult thing often is to convey our ideas and change that person's mind who, at the beginning, did not agree with So you may remember that Ohio just recently, as of last July, no longer requires a front license plate. Here's an example of where lobbyists came Although in. this is now official, lobbyists spent years on both sides advocating for removing the front license plate or for leaving the front license plate. And when it got to Ohio's General Assembly, which is like our version of Congress, there were lobbyists both sides defending their position. Lobbyists representing the Fraternal Order of Police of Ohio were arguing that if you were to remove a front license plate, then you were going to remove an effective tool for police officers to catch accused criminals. Now on the other lobbyists side, lobbyists from car manufacturers argued that they wanted to remove that requirement because having a front license plate could get in the way of adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, and automatic braking. So remember when I said that one of the two big things that interest groups do is gather information and then share it with elected officials? This is the lobbyists representing the interest group, sharing the information with the officials, sharing with our legislators in Ohio um, the dangers of not having a front license plate from the police departments, and then the struggles that manufacturers have when we do have a front license plate. Now, there are two things that interest groups are not. They are not political parties, even though they often are are aligned with one, and they are not PACs, political action committees. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Remember my clever intro about money? money? Let's talk money, about money, where money, politicians money. get money. One of the ways is from small contribution from individuals. It can be from five to a hundred dollars. That was one of the ways that Bernie Sanders tried to co connect with Americans when he was running. He was saying that most of his money came from individual small donors. The other way politicians can get money is from wealthy contributions. Now, there are some limitations. For instance, no individual person can give more than $2,100 to any federal candidate or campaign, and no, no individual person can give $5,000 to any PAC or $26,700 to a national party committee, like the Republican National Party. And all of those donations are public. A way we can look at it is actually through this website, opensecrets.com. Sorry, opensecrets.org, but let's take a look. I asked one of my classes to share with me who was a popular celebrity at this time, but no one gave me any names. So let's go with the name that I'm sure you're all familiar with, Donald Trump. So if we type his name and search it there, it'll show who he's donated to. So let's see, he donated to Trump Make America Great Again recipient, and then here's some politicians he's um, donated to. He's donated to Mark Foley, who was a Republican, um, if you keep scrolling down, though, interestingly enough, 2002, he actually donated $1,000 to Hillary Clinton. Now, maybe that's not surprising to you. As you know, Donald Trump did used to identify as a Democrat. Um, but it's interesting, and you can look up what people have donated because this money has to be public. Candidates can also spend their own money. Ross Perot famously spent $65 million to run as independent in 1992. Um, they can start temporary fundraising organizations. When you are currently in office, government money is actually being used to spend or is being used to let you travel to potential campaign rallies. So you're um, essentially using government money to campaign. But what I wanted to talk to you about today are non-party groups like political action committees or PACs. So interest groups aren't affiliated with a political party, but the interest groups will form PACs, which then use money to help campaign for a politician, for a political party. And that's something else that you can look up on opensecrets.org. I mentioned the NRA earlier. Let's see who they've donated to. And if you scroll through, almost all of their donations have been to Republican candidates or the Republican State Committee of Massachusetts, um, the RNC, the Republican National Committee. Going back a few weeks when we talked about the differences between the Republican and Democratic parties, you may remember Democrats are more apt to talk about gun control while Republicans are more apt to talk about um, securing their Second Amendment rights. And so it makes sense that the NRA is going to be 
um, supporting Republican candidates with funding. So can PACs be a good thing? They can because essentially they represent you and they help to keep your candidate in office. Can they be a bad thing? Running a campaign for any office is expensive. A major candidate's campaign and their allied groups can spend tens of millions of dollars on commercials, conducting polls, running ads, and paying for other expenses during a single election cycle. But where does all that money come from? Enter the campaign finance vehicle known as a political action committee, or PAC for short. A PAC is a group set up to raise donations from individuals or organizations with the goal to spend that money on efforts to elect or defeat certain candidates. These PACs, usually formed around certain interests, can do that through support of specific candidate campaigns, ballot initiatives, or legislation. The first PAC was formed in 1944, when the Congress of Industrial Organizations created one for President Franklin Roosevelt's re-election. While helpful, PACs have their limitations. There are caps on the amount collected from individuals and groups and on the amount given out. However, a super PAC can raise much more. The difference is that these groups can raise unlimited sums of money from donors, but they cannot coordinate with candidates' campaigns or parties. They could, however, coordinate with another super PAC and spend billions of dollars to support certain campaigns or causes. These groups were formed in 2010 after a ruling by the U.S. Court of Appeals, a case linked to the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision that same year. Super PACs can spend money independently on ads, mailings, and more, and must file regular financial reports with the FEC. The proliferation of super PACs in the decades since their creation has reshaped elections up and down the ballot. It's allowed wealthy donors to spend big on their favored races and in some ways even diminish the importance of the candidates' own campaigns, which can accept much smaller capped contributions. And with little expectation that the country's campaign finance rules will change anytime soon, they're a part of the political landscape that's here to stay. So when I asked if you think PACs could be a bad thing, this is what I meant. This My guy again, Fulbright, I know he was being funny, but he mentioned that politicians, especially those in the House of Representatives, spend a good portion of their time fundraising. And it's true. They have to raise money so that they can win re-election. And so the problem that some think occur, um, and if you do some research, you can probably find it happen, is that politicians, they run for office and they tell their constituents that this is what they stand for and this is what they're going to run on. But if they know a certain group is giving them money, they may be more apt to pass legislation or to fight against legislation that isn't in the benefit of their um, the people funding them. Here's an example of Donald Trump accusing some senators of being afraid of the NRA. And what he means is that, are you not willing to pass these bills because you think the NRA will stop funding your campaigns? I can get this weapon at 18, I don't know. So I was just curious as to what you did in your bill. We, you know we, didn't, we didn't address it as president. Well, I think you know we, why? Because you're afraid of the NRA, right? <laughs> I'm actually going to have you do some research on this using OpenSecrets.org with this week's Google form. I'm going to give you a scenario and you're going to actually trace legislation and interest group and donations to see if you think these um, legislators were making the decision with pure interest or with the interest of money. So you have that Google form. Um, it does have a few video clips and um, images and so it will take you a bit of time. So again, make sure that you start this at a time when you can start and finish. I read that Google is working on an opportunity for you to be able to start a Google form and then finish it later, but that hasn't been released yet. But anyway, you have that Google form and then I have another ed puzzle for you on the formation of interest groups that I thought might give you a little bit better idea of how they formed. And then this one, um, please keep in mind that this Friday is actually the end of the nine weeks. I don't know how it creeped up on that, us like that. So make sure you get in any of your missing work. Grades will be due um, for my class and your other classes. And then next week, our last week before spring break is going to be a little bit different. So keep an eye out for that as well. Congratulations on making it through three fourths of this crazy school year. Make it a great week. Money, 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 money. money.